Hello, this is Jared Niemi here with a mini lecture on linear regression from a Bayesian perspective, and particularly the objective Bayesian linear regression analysis. So just as a reminder, linear regression is trying to build a model to understand the relationship between a response variable y and explanatory variables x. Here we have a possibility of uh, k of those explanatory variables. Typically, we have observations from experimental units for both the response and the explanatory variable values for x. The typical assumptions in linear regression are that uh, there's a re linear relationship between the mean for y and the explanatory variables, that we have independence between experimental units, and that there's a constant variance around the mean. So we can encapsulate this in the model here, where we've now assumed that uh, we also have normality. So the response variable for experimental unit i is independent with normal, normal distribution whose mean is a linear combination of the explanatory variables and a constant variance. Typically, we'll include an intercept. And in this notation, an intercept just means that the first explanatory variable value is 1 for all experimental units. We can alternatively write this in matrix notation. In a matrix notation, now y here, which has dimension n, has a multivariate normal distribution whose mean vector is x times beta, where x here is an n by k uh, design matrix, where each row of this design matrix is just the values of the explanatory variable for experimental unit i. Multiply that design matrix x by the vector beta, and that defines the mean for this, vector, for this joint distribution for all the observations y. And we have a variance covariance matrix that's just the constant sigma squared times the identity matrix because, again, we've assumed independence. The standard uh, objective Bayesian analysis uses the non-informative prior given here, where the joint distribution for beta and sigma squared is just proportional to the inverse of sigma squared. It turns out that you can write the joint distribution of the posterior as the product of the posterior conditional distribution of beta given sigma squared times the marginal posterior for sigma squared. The conditional distribution for beta given sigma squared has a normal distribution with some mean and variance, where the variance here is multiplied, right, the variance covariance matrix V beta is multiplied by the actual value for sigma squared. And the marginal posterior for sigma squared is an inverse gamma with these parameters, or equivalently an inverse scaled chi-square distribution. We could also go ahead and find the marginal distribution for beta by integrating out sigma squared. And we'll find that beta has a t distribution with n minus k degrees of freedom, location beta hat, and um, scale s squared v beta, where this s squared here is the same as that s squared that I'll get to in a second. All right, so I need to tell you what these hyperparameter values actually are in the posterior. Beta hat is just your standard ordinary least squares or maximum likelihood estimator, x transpose x inverse, x transpose y. The variance covariance matrix V beta here ends up being x transpose x inverse. And s squared is just our standard, like, standard estimator for sigma squared. All right, so for those who haven't seen it before, uh, when you see it later, you should check to make sure that these are, in fact, the ordinary least squares and maximum likelihood estimators. All right, since we are using a non-informative prior, we need to make sure that the posterior is proper. It turns out that this only depends on the design matrix X. We need to make sure that it has more rows than columns, and we need to make sure that its rank is at least the number of columns. Okay, so we could use these equations right here to go ahead and calculate these hyperparameter values, but it turns out this will not be efficient nor numerically stable, and so instead we'll use the QR decomposition. For any for a matrix X, the QR decomposition is just a matrix Q, which is orthogonal, times a matrix R, which is upper triangular. This is actually orthonormal, right, matrix of orthonormal columns. Okay, and so if we want to calculate the quantities of interest, we just substitute QR for the X. To go ahead and do that by properties of the transpose, we have this Q 
Q times Q because it's orthogonal is just the identity matrix. We have R transpose R inverse. We could also write this again using properties now of uh, inverses as R inverse R prime inverse. The other quantity of interest is the estimator for beta. Same thing, plug in QR, noting that this variance here, this V beta is just this quantity right there, so we've already got that computed. All right, and now we have uh, R prime inverse R prime, which is just the identity. So we have that relationship. If we multiply both sides by R, we get this linear system of equations. It turns out this will be computationally convenient because there are uh, good solvers for this system of linear equations for the upper triangular matrix R. <clears throat> All right, so let's look at an example. Here's an example relating cricket chirps to temperature. Here we think that temperature derives the number of cricket chirps, so we're going to use temperature as the explanatory variable and chirps as the response. We create our design matrix X here, where we've now included an intercept column, compute the QR decomposition, and ensure that the posterior is proper. Then we go ahead and calculate the hyperparameter values using making use of this number of QR specific functions in R. The QR.R, which just extracts the R matrix, the upper triangular matrix. QR.solve, which does that uh, efficient um, decomposition. We have a function to actually extract the residuals and so forth. Then finally, we go ahead and simulate from the posterior. You should go ahead and verify that it makes sense to you. Uh, how this uh, equation works to get draws from beta without having to loop through uh, all the values for sigma. Okay, so we can look at posterior distributions here, or equivalently, we could look at uh, quantiles. Here's the quantile for the variance, or for now, for the standard deviation, sigma. And then we also have the variance for... Uh, sorry, the quantiles, the credible intervals for the intercept here and for the temperature explanatory variable here. So this would say that there seems to be a relationship between temperature and cricket chirps. And we can compare these credible intervals to the uh, confidence intervals and note that they are, to rounding error, to Monte Carlo variability really, they are equivalent. Right, so this means that in performing a non-Bayesian a uh, maximum likelihood and confidence interval based approach to regression, we can actually interpret the confidence intervals that we get in a Bayesian manner. All right, so in summary, I just wanted to mainly point out here that uh, objective Bayesian regression, uh, the answers can actually be found in closed form in terms of the credible intervals for beta and for posterior for sigma squared. Um, Oftentimes, though, we'll use computational techniques via simulation to actually simulate from the joint posterior distribution. Uh, and if we're doing that, we really need to be thoughtful about uh, how we do our matrix computations and often using decompositions which make these uh, matrix computations more numerically stable and efficient. Thank you.